I'm Sabon, Gallery Coordinator at Gertrude Contemporary. I'm here today with Gertrude studio artist Andrew Atchison and we're going to take a look at his practice, particularly the body of work, Figure in the Round, in relation to the BCE Art Contemporary Framework. The contemporary framework can be used to interpret an artwork, irrespective of when it was created, by looking at it from current viewpoints. Artists have explored common ideas, concepts, questions, and practices to examine their own context and to describe their personal world and imagine their future through the artwork, artworks they make and view. The contemporary framework is used to examine art ideas and issues originating in the late 20th century onwards and apply these ideas and artworks in a range of periods of times and cultures. Contemporary art and ideas can relate to the use of new media and technologies and to diverse and alternative approaches to making and presenting art. So Andrew, can you please tell me about you and your practice? Sure. Uh, so I have been um, practicing as an artist for about 15 years since I finished honours. And I um, am based in Melbourne and I also work out of Gertrude Contemporary Studios. I studied at Monash and RMIT universities. And at the moment I work in uh, drawing, sculpture and photography, um, but I also occasionally curate exhibitions and do some writing as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm quite interested in working in public space. I think it's quite a uh, dynamic context to work in because there's a lot of um, kind of pre-existing conditions that are not really in the gallery, which is, you know, generally designed to be um, uh, a more or less blank space. And I'm particularly interested in outdoor public spaces. So kind of the spaces where a lot of people feel like they have ownership um, and that uh, kind of, I guess, supposed to be reflective of um, the publics that use them, who those people are. And I'm particularly interested in statues because they seem to make quite strong statements about the society that they're, that they're produced by. There are two works in particular in your series of works titled Figure in the Round that I believe are particularly relevant to um, the contemporary framework. These works are Figure in the Round Statue from 2017 and Figure in the Round Reduction from 2019. And both of these works involve the temporary installation of armatures around public sculpture. Um, the first features armatures that hold colourful discs and the second aluminium discs. Um, let's start talking about statue first, um, which was installed around the sculpt a sculpture of um, Charles Latrobe, the first governor of Victoria, and sculpted by Melbourne artist Peter Corlett. Um, can you tell me why you were drawn to this sculpture what you believe the sculptor's original intent was in creating the piece and what messages and ideas your sculptural intervention is trying to convey. Sure, Ken. So this work came about as part of a program that was run by the City of Melbourne called Test Sites, which gave some funding to temporary experimental public works. Um, and originally I wanted to use a different statue, but it wasn't within the section of the city that this program was focusing on. So. I looked around for alternatives and found this statue of um, Charles Latrobe at the front of the State Library of Victoria. And there's a few different reasons I was interested in it. And um, so some of them are that it's, it looks very traditional. Um, it looks like it could be quite old, but it's actually only from 2010. So it's a bit of an anomaly. Um, that also the context that it's in, in front of the State Library of Victoria is um, a really <clears throat> dynamic space. It's a space where a lot of rallies happen, where people gather socially. Um, also, I don't know if it still happens, but on Sundays there used to be uh, literal soapbox sessions where people would get up and kind of preach their ideas. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, I guess it's quite loaded with meaning for different people. Um, and what I wanted to do with this project for test sites was uh, work with the very 
traditional form of statuary. So the, the form of statuary that is really uh, focused on realism and often uh, is trying to create a heroic image of someone. And I was interested in, uh, as an artist, I'm really interested in visual language and how artworks communicate specific values or concepts through the choice that, that an artist has made, <clears throat> either formally or technically or materially. Um, and with the statue, um, I, with, well, with statues in, in public spaces, I, the way I approach them is as texts. So they're, it's, it's like you can read them like you can read a written text. So the visual language of the statue um, tells you a lot about the intent of the artist. <clears throat> and also what that artist wants you to think about the subject of the statue, so the person it's portraying. Um, and the statue, I, I did some reading up about it. The statue came about um, by, it was commissioned by a group of people who are dedicated to the legacy of Charles Latrobe, who is Victoria's first governor. Um, and the sculptor who made it, Peter Corlett, is known for his um, realist, realist um, portrait kind of sculptures. Um, and so he was commissioned to make this work. And I think the intent that he had was, I mean, uh, he was commissioned, so his intent was to fulfil um, the desires of the commissioners. So they wanted a, a representation of Charles Latrobe that made him, that, that placed him in a positive kind of light. Um, and I think the, the artist must have been, I, I'm guessing the artist must have been invested in that uh, to a degree as well, because it, takes quite a, lot, a long time to create one of these statues. And if you weren't interested, I think it would be really difficult to do a good job of it. Um, and with the, if you look at the posture of the statue, he's very upright. Um, the costume he's in is military costume. And he's also holding a small book, like he's giving an address. So I was really interested in how regimented this representation was. So uh, military is all about order. Um, standing and giving a dress also conjures up the idea of an audience. So I was quite interested in the way the statue has a, a point of view that seems to dictate where an audience would stand. And so I was interested in um, how that kind of an object shapes public space, really, and then in intervening with that. Um, so what I did was I used... Uh, they're called C stands. They're usually used in photography to hold lighting um, props and things like that. Um, and instead, I, I got these large acrylic discs cut um, of transparent different colours and placed them around. Um, and there's a few different ideas in the mix, really. Um, I'm quite. In, I, I like to use a lot of colour in my work generally, um, and I think it's because I'm interested in. Um, uh, I mean, I, I like the way colour looks in general, but I'm also interested in it as, um, I guess, a communication of things coming apart. So like with, um, you know, with white light, when it's fed through a prism, it kind of comes apart and becomes less solid. Or when you see maybe uh, petrol in a puddle in the street, you get that iridescence that is also doing a different kind of diffraction. Um, so it's kind of symbolically in visual language, it's kind of like a breakdown of things using multicolours. And I place them in different uh, positions around the statue. And because they're round, they suggest uh, lenses in a way. And so that idea of different or alternate perspectives to the frontal perspective that the statue has. So kind of uh, working against it, um, but also remaining quite abstract. So the works, the, the, the intervention don't, don't really they tell exactly what they're trying to do. So it's still quite open to interpretation. Um, and also they're completely temporary and they don't affect the site or the statue at all. So at the end of the one day that they were up, I took them away and it was like nothing had ever happened. So in terms of visual and sculptural language, it's kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum to the statue itself, where it's, uh, the statue is bronze and stone and is heavy and is aiming for permanence. Um, and these... Uh, artworks are modular and adjustable and can be installed and removed uh, with zero impact. So I'm quite interested in ephemeral versus permanent because um, they're different kinds of intentions or aspirations. So, yeah. Did that cover what you were 
kind of thinking about Sabon? Yeah, and then the other thing that I thought of is that the um, different coloured lenses could reflect um, different individuals and their perspective on the world. And I know you and I have spoken before about this saying, seeing the world through rose-coloured glasses. Um, so the, the second artwork is um, reduction. And so this is a similar sculptural intervention around courage by William, I'm going to say his last name wrong, wrong Eckholz, is it? Eckholz? Eckholz. Eckholz, um, which stands outside of the Fitzroy Town Hall. Um, so why did this sculpture appeal to you and what symbols and metaphors um, do you think the artist has used here, his original intent for the piece, and what ideas and messages are you trying to convey with your work around this? Yeah, sure. So um, I was interested in this sculpture because it's in a part of the city that I um, am, am generally around a lot. Um, so it was part of the kind of space that I was moving through regularly. I also um, applied for a residency that was in the same building as the town hall. And I took that opportunity to think, well, maybe I can work with that sculpture. And that was part of my proposal for that residency, that I would develop work over six months and uh, the outcome of that residency would be some kind of work around that statue. Um, and the other thing that is interesting is that it is, um, in a way, it's, it's traditional because it is made out of bronze and it is um, a figural and it is a realistic representation. But, sorry, the statue I'm talking about. Um, but on the other hand, it is a fictional character. So it's kind of, um, the statue is a kind of young muscular man coming out of a lion costume. And the symbolism is <clears throat> related to the cowardly lion uh, from the Wizard of Oz, um, kind of having courage and pride in your own identity. Um, and the statue itself was put up uh, in memory or uh, in dedication to Ralph McLean, who was um, Australia's first openly gay elected official, who was elected to the city of Fitzroy in 1982. And he lived from 1957 to 2010. And there is very few public markers or memorials to, um, you know, uh, openly gay people or, or queer people in public space. So I was quite interested in that as well. Um, the symbols, yeah, so the symbols is you, uh, sorry, this um, statue, as we said, is made by um, William Eichholz, and the uh, symbols and metaphors that are used are kind of drawn from fiction. So we're talking about the Wizard of Oz. Um, and the reason, there's kind of two reasons why he's chosen them. One is that in the story, the cowardly lion gains this kind of courage to be himself, and so that's related to the idea of being oneself um, and uh, open about one's sexuality, even if it's not um, accepted by a lot of people, even if it could be like when Ralph McLean was alive, it could, put him, could have put him in danger. There would have been people kind of aggressive about that. So there's, there's bravery there. But also uh, the Wizard of Oz um, has a kind of symbolism for gay men of a certain generation because Judy Garland was Dorothy and she was quite a gay icon. So to a certain generation of gay men, it's, uh, it's quite rich in symbolism and metaphor. Um, and so I was, I was interested in, uh, well, in a, in a few different things. In one sense, this was a representation of uh, gay identity um, that was put out there as quite a, um, a, gen a general representation, I think, but actually it was quite specific. Um, and in, in the other sense, even though it was dedicated to one man, it was also um, in, the, in the plaque for the statue, it says that it represents uh, kind of the whole LGBTQIA plus community, which is a whole lot of diversity being represented again beneath a very specific set of symbols. So I thought, well, it's interesting that all that is being crammed in there because I don't see a lot of those identities reflected in the visual language and the metaphorical language. Um, and in this sense, so going back again to looking at the statue as a text, something that you can read messages from, um, I saw there was a text about a, a very specific uh, subset of the community, which is gay men of a certain generation, um, and probably from a specific kind of background as well. Um, 
And if you thought about the earlier discs as maybe being like coloured annotations around um, the statue, which is the text, this is more like creating um, space through blankness in the text. So I was thinking, um, in my visual language, thinking about, you might have seen a document that's been released and certain sensitive information will be blocked out, will be redacted so that it can't be read. And I'm interested in how curious this makes us to know what is underneath all that, um, all that black in the text. Um, and these, what they've become is like visual silences. And so I was thinking, how can I create those visual silences within this three dimensional text? And so the aluminium is opaque rather than transparent. So rather than tinting something and presenting a point of view, it's um, kind of multiple, it could be multiple perspectives again, but they're blank. And I guess rather than thinking about those blanknesses as nothing, I'm thinking about them as room for imagining what might be behind them. So then it's quite um, a, a liberating kind of idea. So the, the statue is a very specifically articulated text and this is creating space in that specificity by introducing blankness for the viewer to then imagine their own um, content, if they like. I think that covered it, that covered everything. And what about, um, you know, aluminium has this reflective quality as well. So I'm imagining people um, coming and, vi and viewing your intervention and being able to see themselves in your work very literally and that kind of for me speaks quite nicely to um you know creating more diversity in the people that the, the work is representing rather than as you say with um Ecolt's work just one figure being represented i don't know how you feel about that yeah no i mean it's interesting um so with with the aluminium you're right reflective it is reflective, but the way I treated it, it wasn't actually that high sheen. So what you would have seen is almost like um, a frosted mirror kind of effect. So there would be kind of vague reflections of the people standing near them, but it wasn't like mirror-like. Mm. But I do think that vagueness is still kind of interesting because again, it's not a, uh, a really sharp reflection that's really definitional. It's still like a kind of vague thing. So then that's interesting to think about, like looking at yourself, but with your boundaries a little bit um, blurred out, so maybe a little bit more space for thinking. Interpretation or... Interpretation, yeah. Yeah. Um, so as we've spoken about, obviously, both these works have interacted in the public domain around public sculpture. Um, how do you think the placement or location of these works impacts on their meaning or value? And we've touched on this a little bit already, but maybe we can flesh it out a bit more. Um, and in what ways do your interventions contemporize these works? Sure. So I think um, public space is really attractive to me because it is quite, um, it's almost like a high tension kind of space because uh, the idea of public space is that everyone owns it and everyone has a stake in it. So that means that any choice of an artwork that goes into public space has a huge number of stakeholders in terms of um, what it represents and what it supposedly communicates. And um, I think the first question it throws up that's really interesting is what is the public and how is it defined? Um, and I've, I've read about public sculptures as being like reflections of what a society, or representations of what a society wants to see reflected back of itself. So the selection of uh, personage to be turned into these statues is quite significant because it represents the values of a society, what it thinks it is, or maybe what it aspires to be. But, um, you know, in Melbourne, for instance, there, most of the statues are colonial era statues and, and colonial figures. Um, and so that represents a particular, a very particular portion of, what, it, what the public might be here, um, and also very particular politics and point of view over who should be represented. So it's quite loaded. I, I'm not really going into those specific issues so much, but I'm really interested in the, in the form of the statue. So not so much the individuals portrayed, but um, how they've been portrayed in this medium. 
and the public space I think is interesting because it is where I think artists will get the most scrutiny of their work and so it's quite challenging but also quite satisfying and you get people engaging with something you've done who might not otherwise who might not go into galleries that often or you um also people feel like they want to come up and say something to you while you're doing something and with both these works because they're temporary i put them up and then stayed with them so i would just be sitting nearby but people would often come up and you know have a chat and be interested and it, it's um good to get uh um, to interact with people who are not uh quote unquote art people so to speak um but i think in terms of the statues so the, the forms of the ones that I've interacted with are very traditional, like bronze, you know, it's a technique that goes back thousands of years. Um, and interestingly, it's also a material that projects forward thousands of years. So a bronze statue can last 2000 years pretty easily. So it's taking an image of our society now, um, you know, potentially 2000 years into the future. So it's quite a powerful statement. And I think like we touched on earlier, working around them in a very ephemeral way um, is markedly contemporary and in contrast to that traditional way of uh, having an ambition to make your artwork permanent or um, somehow kind of almost like it's conquered nature, like it will be there no matter what happens. Whereas doing something temporary is a gesture kind of in the opposite direction. Um, not to say permanence isn't good, but I think the statues have a particular position and, and a particular communication the way they're being made and then that gives me something to work against by using temporary forms around them or alongside them. So for you, what is the importance of um, documentation and being able to capture these works and share them with both current and future audiences? Sure, so documentation uh, is really important because these works come and go quite quickly. They're only up for four or five hours at a time. And so quite a limited audience of people will see them. And documentation allows me to continue to have conversations with people about the ideas in the work, um, but also to uh, use those images to, um, I, get, I guess, get further opportunities to make more in that series of works. Um, so I'll use images of previous iterations to propose, you know, doing iterations around other sculptures, which is something that I want to do. Um, but there's an interesting kind of um, catch-22 with documenting sculptural work, you know, the way the art, the pieces are made is intended to involve people moving around. And like you say, that idea of different points of view relative to where your body is in relation to the sculpture is quite important. And I talked about the Latrobe statue dictating a kind of point of view. Um, well, then the, the photographic lens dictates its own points of view, which then it, it kind of reframes into a flat still thing. So there's a little bit of a conflict there, but you can also end up with really beautiful images of the works, which I think down the track might end up becoming artworks in themselves or um, something along those lines. So um, thank you so much for sharing all your thoughts and insights, um, Andrew, for this resource. And um, yeah, thank you. Welcome. Thank you for your questions. It's been nice to talk about.